We turn for our reading now into 1 Samuel, we'll take it up 1 Samuel, we've done the first 15 chapters, well not in one night of course, but over a time, and we come to chapter 16 uh, this evening, Samuel's book of 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. And when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders, elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eli and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called it double bad and made it pass in front of Samuel, and Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse made some heart pass, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. And he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him, but will not sit down until he arrives. So they sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel went to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit had the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendants said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the liar. It will come and play when the evil spirit of God comes on you and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I've seen a son of Jesse Bethlehem who knows how to play the liar. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well, he's a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son, David, to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. And whenever the Spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul, and he would feel better. And the evil spirit would leave him. May God bless us the reading of that word. 1 Samuel chapter 16 is a, well, it's a bit of a watershed, really, in many ways. Samuel chapter 16 is very much a turning point. In the first eight chapters, of course, uh, we've seen uh, the life of Samuel in many, many ways. And then uh, from 9 to 15... Uh, the rise and the fall of Saul. And now we come to this section, particularly verse chapter 16 to 31. Uh, in verses 1 to 13, David's anointing, and then 18 to 23, preparation for service. 1 to 13, anointing, 18 to 23, preparation. There's a lot in this. So let's crack on. Verses 1 to 13. And uh, several thoughts came to me as we looked at this. And one of the things that struck out most of all is, is a simple sentence. is this. God knows what looks in the, 
what's in the heart and not what's in the outward appearance. God sees the heart beyond the outward appearance. It's what's inside a person that counts, not what they appear to be. I don't know. At times we put on a brave face and a good show, particularly in difficult circumstances. And even as we believers, we're Christians this evening, we know what it is to put on a good show of spirituality at times. And yet all the time our heart is not quite right with God. Our heart isn't, isn't in tune with him. And that's what the Lord says here to Samuel. Never mind the outward appearance, I know the heart. So let's look at Samuel's heart then. Samuel, he was per far from perfect, but well, nobody is. But we read that he had a good heart. He had a good heart. What does that mean? Well, first of all, he had a sorrow for sin. He mourned. He was sorrowful for sin. For Saul's sin and his own sin. The things that he did wrong in his life. The things he did that he shouldn't do. The times when he wasn't really in tune with God. And he was sorrowful for that. He mourned about it. And of course he really mourned about Saul's lack of his potential greatness. And the influence of God upon his kingdom. But he also prayed for his own lack of faith. We'll see that as we go through. His own lack of faith. When, when God wanted him to go, he said, well, well I can't. Yeah. <laughs> He'll kill me if I go. There is a time for us to be sorrowful for our state of our heart before God, whether we know him or not. He knows us. And of course, Samuel was, was sorrowful for Saul. He mourned for Saul as well as himself. And you know, we have to pray for one another. We have to be sorry for those who are going through difficult times. Those of our brothers and sisters who, well, because of circumstance, situations, their heart is not right with God and we pray for them. We're sorry for the time they're going through, but we need to pray for them. And praying for one another shows real support for one another, does it not? And the second thing we see here about Samuel's heart is that he trusted God even though it meant putting himself in danger. You know, there are times when we go through difficult experiences, whether we and ourselves or somebody that we love and care for who is going through a difficult time, testing time, probably an illness, unemployment, or whatever. There are times when we go through trying situations. And what happened here? Samuel said, it's a difficult situation you've asked me to do. If I go, he says in verse 2, and Saul hears, he'll kill me. There could be nothing worse than that, more dangerous than that. But the Lord said, this is what you have to do. And what do we read in verse 4? Samuel did what the Lord said. Isn't that telling? Samuel did what the Lord said. He didn't want to. He was fearful. He knew the dangers. But he had a trust in God. And that's the trust we need to know. Ongoing, is it not? As we seek to face life's difficulties and trials, sometimes dangerous situations, how good it is to know that we have a God who cares, who's with us, who will look after us. The Lord said to David, to Samuel, look, you go, I'll take care of you. Never mind what you see, and I know there's dangers, I know there's problems, I know you're going through a difficult time, but I am with you. So Samuel did what the Lord said. That's crucial for every one of us, particularly those of us who love the Lord. 
Whatever the situation, we have one we know we can turn to. Sometimes he's the last person to turn to, isn't he? But he should be the first. It was the psalmist who said, If the Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? It's true, isn't it? If God is with us, who can be against us? And then the third thing I see here, not only was he a, a, obedient and obeyed God's command, yes, he did what the Lord said, but he was showing his real heart for the Lord here. He was mourning for his sin, he was sorry for his sin, he knew there was difficulties, but he was trusting God to lead him. You know, the Lord always knows best, doesn't he? Always knows best. It's ours to trust and to follow. Trust and to follow. And now we see Samuel in verses 6 to 10, having gone through all of God's rejection of the brothers, and they all came forward. Which one's going to be a king? Who? Oh, not him, not him, not him. But he did say there in verse 6, Surely the Lord's anointed is here somewhere. He's here. And although it wasn't working out just straight away, he knew that God was in control. God was in command. And God gave him a little clue in verse 7. Do not consider his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. How often do we make judgments on people? Having first met them or known them for some time, we make judgments. Judgments about their conduct, judgments about attendance, judgments about this, that, or whatever. Without really knowing them. This is a real challenge, challenge to me. Because we often make judgments about people, especially fellow believers, without really knowing their situation and circumstances. So easy to judge, isn't it? But to take time to get to know somebody who've never really we spent time with is a real challenge. The natural thing is when we go for a coffee to gravitate to the one we've always spoken to or someone you're going to get a good response from. But it's good the one you don't really know very much about, that you might learn more about them. And if somebody who's not regular comes amongst us, we welcome them. We show them care and love. And we don't make judgment based on what we see, but what we know. That's very important. And it cuts out a lot of badness and ill feel or whatever. And by the same token, the more we try and put on a good appearance, the more the Lord sees. The more the Lord sees. Having done all that, what happens in verse 11? Are all these the sons you've got? Ah, well, there's, uh, there's one looking after the sheep. He wasn't considered very important, not like all the others. So he sent for him and brought him in. This was David. And he sent for him and he brought in and he was glowing with health and the fine appearance, handsome features, and the Lord said, this is the one. What did he say? Surely the Lord's anointed to see it. He was, but he was looking after the sheep until he was brought before Samuel, the youngest of the brothers. Sometimes, you know, it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26, 27, look at this. Do not think of what you were called. Not many are wise by human standards, not many influential, not many of noble birth, but God chooses sometimes the foolish of things of the world to shame the wise, the weak things of the world to shame the strong, the lowly things to despise things. God doesn't just choose, although he does choose many intellectuals and high flyers. It's the ordinary, the ordinary man and woman and young person 
that so often is the one who others wouldn't give a, a look at. That God says, you're mine. You're mine. And that's why we have verse 12. Here's David comes on the scene. Now we've already said that outward appearance is not always the best judge of a person's, a person's spiritual condition. But at the same time, a person's appearance can tell you something about their position in God. And sometimes their appearance and their attitude and action can sometimes be a witness to their faith. I came across this lovely quote. It goes like this. Only God can see the heart, but the world sees our desire to be good witnesses to what is on the inside. He goes on, I once heard someone say of a fellow member of the church, there is something about their attitude and appearance that shows their love for God. Now doesn't that speak volumes? Something about their attitude and their appearance that makes them stand out. I've told you the tale many times when I was working in industry. Been there quite a few months. A guy came up and he said, listen, what's different about you? What's different about you? Why are you different? I, I hadn't realised I'd done anything. I said, do you want to know? He said, yes, I told him. I belong to Jesus. I knew there was something, he said. Those we mix with, those we work with, those our neighbours, by our attitude and our actions, even our appearance, do we show something of the love of God and our faith in Jesus. So David, verse 13, is anointed and filled with the Spirit of God. This is God's chosen vessel. Now, I came across this lovely fact. Uh, Matthew probably already knows this one, and Matt as well. This is the first time David's name's mentioned. And, of course, he's the only person named David in the whole of Scripture. And I give you this. David's name goes on to appear 600 times in the Old Testament and 60 times in the New Testament. Did you know that, guys? There's a fact you take away. David was going to be the one that God was going to bring great deliverance for his people and ultimately a wonderful saviour in his son the Lord Jesus Christ so Samuel anoints him he pours oil on him to indicate that this is a chosen one of God but it'll be many years before David actually becomes king now that's very important in the same way you know God might have some work for you to do in this future that he's preparing you for now. Do you know that? David went back to looking after the sheep after he'd been anointed king, but it was going to take some time. Who knows what particular task God has for you in the future, and even now he's preparing you for it. You might not be aware of it, or you might be. Leading you a certain direction in work or service. Leading you in some way of understanding his word and his scriptures. And David was being equipped for future service, and you never know. And it doesn't matter what age you are, God might have some work for you that maybe he's spending a lifetime preparing you for it. I know we have elders in the church. It doesn't mean to say they've got to be over 70, be, be one. <laughs> but it does mean that they're full of uh, years of wisdom and experience. Do you like that yeah, hype there, guys? But there we are. I will get one or two young ones as well, of course. But there's a work for you within the church of God that even now God might be preparing you for it. So look for opportunities to serve him, to work for him. Some little service, whatever it might be. Because it's all part of preparation. He was looking after sheep. He was going to be a king. You'd think. Something better than that. No, no. Some lowly task God might have for you right now that will eventually lead you to have some real service 
a position in the Church of Christ. Future deacons, future elders, future Sunday school leaders, teachers. God is faithful. And he brought David through all this training because this was going to be his king. Now verse 14 can be very confusing if you look at it at first glance. What does it say? Now the spirit of the Lord did depart from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Wow. God doesn't do things wrong. God doesn't do evil things, does he? What God was doing here was working out his plan and purpose for Saul. And the word tormented can be translated troubled or dismayed. It was all part of God's punishment for Saul for his stubbornness and rebellion, but it was all part of his plan to get David into the palace. And we'll see that. There's nothing happens by chance with God. Everything has a plan and purpose. And the purpose of verse 14, yes, was to remind Saul that he'd done wrong, but it was a means of getting David into the palace. What was the situa solution to the problem there of this evil spirit? Well, go to music. Go to music. Psalm 33 says, Sing joyfully to the Lord, praise the Lord with a harp, make music to him, sing new song and shout for joy. One of God's gifts to the church is music. Martin Luther said this, Next to the word of God, music deserves the highest praise. There is healing power in music. And that's true in it. Doesn't it lift your spirit when you're singing together the praise to God? Let's give thanks for our musicians amongst us who will play for us week by week, of course. Christian, where would we be without them, Ruth? But it does lift us, doesn't it, when we sing praises to God? And that was the solution. Let Let's all hear the music and the evil spirit will be lifted. Now it seems to me that again three things, that's a magic word in it, these verses tell us. First, we should develop skills for God's glory. Remember the parent of talents. <laughs> Jesus approved a man who used his talents and developed them further. What gift have God prepared you for and planned and gave you? That you're not using. You're not using. Might be some hidden musicians amongst us. Might be some hidden whatever. Real one to one witnesses. Secondly, we're to maintain a good reputation with us. Verse 18 says, The Lord is with him. And Proverbs says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. The Lord was with him. And the Lord is with us as we seek to serve him. And be ready for opportunities. There in verse 19 and 20, there was opportunity now for David to go into the court. Into the king's presence. What is interesting, that after David was anointed to be future king, yeah, he went back to looking after sheep. But notice, God would make things happen in his own time. It was, again, C.H. Spurgeon said this, Saul did not know he was inviting the future king into the palace, but God was planning it. But God was planning it. Who knows what God is doing behind the scenes in your life and in my life? Timothy says, be prepared in season and out of season for whatever the Lord wants you to do. Now we've talked about dealing with problems, difficulties in our lives, being prepared for service. And lastly, we see to serve God where God wants us to be is a challenge of blessing to others as well. That's verses 21 to 22. What a real challenge of blessing there, of course. When we're willing to serve where God wants us to be, 
Yes, he was looking after sheep. And he serves well till he's called in the king's service. It was Timothy who said, those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance of their faith. Now I know this is talking about deacons, but it also reminds us for all of us who are called to work for God in some way or other. At the same time, we're called to be a blessing to others. There we have it in verse 23. A blessing to others. And how important that is as well, that we might bless others by our work and witness. And of course, the word conveys the idea of being refreshed, to breathe easily. Never underestimate the power of a kind and encouraging word. I think I've shared about a lady many, many years ago who used to, at the end of every service, she used to come up to me and say, Pastor, that was a lovely word. Or she would come up and say, Pastor, that particular verse was, was really good. Or then she'd come and say, Pastor, you know, the prayer was so uplifting. I knew I was in trouble one day when she came up and said, Pastor, by the flowers are lovely today. <laughs> Didn't know how to take that. But all the time she was trying to encourage. It doesn't take much, does it? To encourage one another. It lifts one another. That we might be a blessing uh, to others. Whenever the Spirit of God came upon Saul, David would take his lie and play, and relief would come. God used him as a blessing to Saul. <laughs> Proverbs says, Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Never underestimate the power of an encouraging word. It doesn't take much, and it makes the other person feel so much better and uplifted. Again, I've got to quote Spurgeon. He says, you are not blessed to be blessed. You are blessed to be a blessing. Isn't that lovely? You're not blessed to be blessed. You're blessed to be a blessing to others. So don't keep, he says, all God's blessing to yourself. Be a channel of blessing to others. And you will find great refreshing. Now, in all this, of course, it encourages us, it encourages us to keep short accounts with God, it encourages us to be witnesses to him, it encourages us to be obviously desirable to work in his service, uh, to be prepared for every work he wants us to do in the fellowship, to be blessing to one another, to encourage one another, to pray for one another, to understand one another. Don't just take people by, by appearances outward, get to know the heart, get to know them properly get to know their lives. But in all of that, what's the greatest blessing? Well, the greatest blessing, the greatest channel of blessing God gave to us was his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the blessing beyond all blessings. That God sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to be our saviour and Lord. We have no hope. We have no future. There is this life and then nothing. But God sent his son. A tremendous blessing. Jesus is willing to come and die on a cross to take our sin. That sin that stops us having a relationship with God. That sin that stops us getting to heaven. Jesus came to take it away. And you know, we can have a real relationship with God. We can know what it is to walk with God day by day. We can know what it is to have his presence with us. We know what it is to have his leading and his comfort and help. We can know what it is with absolute assurance that there's a place for us in heaven. What do we have to do? Follow him. What does he say? Trust. Trust in me, says Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. Trust me. If you've not done that, why not think about it? Because that's the gateway into a wonderful relationship with God and with God's people and eternity. Yes, in conclusion, this passage teaches that God is sovereign over every detail in our lives. He's interested in every part of us. He's always ready to bless us and encourage us and to lead us on in work and service for him. And every circumstance we can turn to him. But at the same time, 
that we might make known the greatest blessing is to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour and our Lord.